Once again, good morning and blessed Sabbath to each one. The privilege that we have to gather here together is matched only by one other thing in the Christian experience, and that is the joy and privilege that we have to study God's Word. Amen. The fact that God was willing to make a record for us so that we might be able to study. That is very clear about studying the Bible is that no matter how many times you may go over the same chapter, I believe that it's true that you will always find something new and relevant for yourself in Scripture. In Scripture, we're going to talk about one of these instances of something that I myself have discovered that's new for me in something that was written down for us. We're all familiar with the Lord's Prayer. It's recorded in Matthew. We're not going to talk about prayer. We're not going to talk about the Lord's Prayer. But in Matthew, the Lord's Prayer is recorded. And that's usually the one that we remember as kids. Right? That's the one we memorize. That's the one we say when we're little children. Usually when we ask a little child to pray, that's the prayer which they pray. And that same prayer is repeated again in Luke. The Apostle John, wanting to know more how to pray, in Luke chapter 11, he asks Christ something, but in Luke chapter 11, we see more than the prayer. Here, Christ continues. He not only tells us what is the prayer that we should pray, but he also goes on and gives some explanation. And it's in this explanation that we're going to find today something that I believe is wonderful for each one of us. So we have in verse 1 of chapter 11, the Apostle John inquiring, It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, speaking of Christ, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Lord, teach us to pray. And then at this point, the Savior repeats to them the prayer which they should pray. It's an it's approximate way. It contains all the things that they need to know. So from verse 2 to 4, we have the prayer. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So much all of us know here. Nothing that I've said yet is new for any of us that are here. But often we forget that in Luke, Christ continued to explain a little bit more. So I'd like us to read on the rest of the explanation. If your Bible has red letters for the words of Christ, you'll notice that Christ continued to speak. And he continued to speak all the way up until verse 13. So let's continue reading together and see a little bit more about the instructions that Christ gave. Verse 5 says, He said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves? For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, Thou he will not rise and give him, because he is a friend. Yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, Will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? These words are familiar to us. We sometimes disconnect them from the Lord's Prayer, but is in the context of asking that God gives this instruction to his disciples. And yet in here, I found an expression which I could not harmonize with the rest of the text. 
And so I had to study a little bit more. And that's what I want to share with you this morning. Because there's an expression in verse 5. It says that this friend who comes to ask, what kind of friend is he? He comes at what time? He comes at midnight. And today, I want to talk about friends at midnight. What does it mean to have a friend at midnight? This is the only place that I can find this expression, a friend at midnight. Now, most of us might say, well, if someone comes to my home, it's midnight. I'm a health reformer. I went to bed when the sun went down. And if somebody comes, I tell them, look, I'm a health reformer. It's past your bedtime. Go home and go to sleep. I cannot help you now because it's, it's too late right now for me to help you. And yet, it seems here that this friend comes at this most, most inappropriate time. This friend comes at midnight and he asks for assistance and help. If he is really a friend at midnight, Christ says that he will do something. He says that he will actually get up out of bed, even if it disturbs his children that are in bed there. He will get up. And he will go. And how many loaves did the man ask for? He asked for three. But it says here that when he gets up, how much will he give him? As much as he needs. He will not say, oh, you only asked for three. I'll only give you three. He'll say, do you need more? Can I help you more? Maybe I can give you something else besides the bread to help you out. This is the friend at midnight that we want to talk about. As human beings, we're very social creatures. We do not exist alone. It's impossible to exist absolutely alone. We need each other. That's why Christ puts us in fellowship together as we're going to study this morning as we look at what are really friends at midnight. We see that Christ knowing our nature and the way that we are, He knows that alone we fall into a lot of temptation and hardship and trial. But when there are others beside us to help us, then we are able to have more success. Of course, not everybody wants to help us. You know, a few chapters later in the book of Luke, we find the prodigal son in chapter 15. He also has friends, does he not? Oh, when he runs away from home, the prodigal son has lots of friends. As many friends as you can possibly imagine. And they call themselves his friends. They say, I'm your friend. Just as I'm sure you turn around to somebody else who's in this room and you say, I'm your friend. But in which way were they his friends? Well, they were his friends so long as he had cash. As long as he had the cash, they were friends. Good friends. Best friends. They're willing to do anything for the cash. What happened when the cash went away? It's interesting to note that all the friends the multitude of friends that he had, all of them professing their greatest, deepest love for him. When the time came that he was in need, we read there that he was alone. No more friends to help him. No one giving back a little bit of what he'd given them. Were they friends at midnight? No. But they were friends. And this is the distinction that we want to draw this morning. What is the friendship that God would have us have one with another and with Him? And what is the friendship that the world wants us to have? The friendship of the world is based on a very materialistic concept. You're my friend if you can do something for me. Then you're my friend. But if you can't do anything for me, then you're kind of useless to me. And I don't really need to spend a lot of time with you. That's the concept that the world has. That's why the world says you should come together with people that are the same like yourself. Then you help each other out because you're the same. But God has a different concept. And we find this concept most clearly defined in the relationship of David and his friend Jonathan. We see that they had a friendship also. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 18, and verse 1, we find there that in a time of great trial and tribulation, when David was in a lot of trouble, 
in verse, chapter 18 and verse 1, it says, And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Now this then is the definition of biblical <coughs> friendship. To be someone's friend in the Bible means that your soul and the soul of that person, they become one. Are you going to throw away your own soul? If your soul was in trouble, would you cast it aside? Would you make fun of your soul? Would you talk about yourself behind your back? Would you make fun of yourself? Would you tell others things about yourself that no one should know? And yet we call people friends and we do all of these things. We do all of these things and we call these people our friends. The Bible tells us that it's different. True friendship requires that the two souls involved, they become knit together as one. That's why in biblical friendship, there is no talking behind a person's back. Because you can't talk behind your own back. It's impossible. And these two souls become one. As the crisis grew worse, and David was having more and more trouble, you would think that naturally Jonathan would put some strain on their friendship, right? David's getting into more trouble. Saul wants to kill him even more, even harder. They're hunting after David, chasing after David. And you would think that Jonathan would, would start pulling away and saying, well, you know, David, I like you a lot. And, and you're such a good guy. And you know, but man, my dad wants to kill you. So I'm just going to, I'm going to stay over here for a while, just until you resolve things. We're still friends, you know, but I can't really help you right now. But we see that in the contrary, they were real friends. Because as the crisis grew worse, as David's life was more and more in peril, we see two chapters later in 1 Samuel chapter 20. Let's read verse 17 and see what happens here. It says that they were having a discussion here. And Jonathan, in verse 17, And Jonathan caused David to swear again, because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. True friendship, biblical friendship, is then that connection. That's why in Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 17, Proverbs 17, verse 17, that's easy to remember. It says there that a friend loveth, at all times and a brother is born for adversity when does a friend love always so there are a couple definitions of friendship that the bible talks about in order that we might see whether or not we truly are friends at midnight and the bible gives us some things to remind us and tell us to be able to see are we actually that person's friend or are we just kind of a worldly acquaintance to that individual? The first thing that we find, the first characteristic of a friend at midnight is that actions speak louder than words. In Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24, you can read together with me. We'll read quite a few Bible verses this morning, so make sure your Bible is open. In Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24, it says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. It says here that if you are really a friend, then it's not a matter of words. It's a matter of action. True friendship is not defined about what I tell you. I can tell you whatever I want. You know, the, the tongue can move. It doesn't even take very much energy. You know, just moves, 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 moves. It, it's, just, it's just your tongue moving in your mouth, clicking against the roof of your mouth, against your teeth, your cheeks, and making different sounds. And that's nice. I can tell you many things. But the Bible says that if I'm your friend, I will do more than tell you that. What will I do? I will show it. It says that a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. If I tell you I am your friend, 
and you knock on my door at midnight and I tell you to go home and observe health reform, I'm not your friend. I'm not a friend at midnight. I'm your acquaintance. We might get along. I don't hate you, but I'm not your friend. Because a friend must show himself to be friendly. Actions speak louder than words is the very first thing that defines Christian biblical friendship. That's why Christ gave the golden rule. Everybody knows the golden rule from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. It says there, therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets then if we will have friends, what we actually do is we do to them what we would do to ourselves. And why is that? Because we already read in 1 Samuel that true friendship makes the soul one. That's why it says, if you're really a friend, you will do what you would do to yourself. Because you're together, you're one. In fact, for friends, words are usually unnecessary. For true friends, words are unnecessary. Dave Tyson Gentry, he wrote that true friendship comes when silence between two people is comfortable. I can be in a room with somebody and we don't have to talk. We can actually be in each other's company and there's silence and we're comfortable. We don't feel that it's awkward. It just goes to prove that true friendship is something based on actions, not on words alone. So that's the first characteristic of friendship. The second characteristic of biblical friendship, of someone that is our friend, is also found in Proverbs, this time in chapter 27 and verse 10. The wise man, he had quite a few children, and I'm sure that he was educating them and teaching them in how to choose their friends. And so he wrote many things about friendship. And in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 10, we find the second definition of a friend at midnight. It says, Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. Neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity. For better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. The second definition of a friend at midnight is that old friends are cherished. You see, in the world today, friendship is a transitory thing. In other words, today, you're my best friend. Tomorrow, you're my best friend. The day after, you're my best friend. Mm -hmm. And in the world, that's fine. You can move from having one best friend to the next best friend to the next best friend. Satan knows that this is good because he can deceive you with one person, then he can just keep going deceiving you with others. But according to the Bible, true friendship, a friend at midnight, cherishes old friends. It says that friendship even continues down generational lines. Your father's friend should be your friend. So old friends in the Bible are cherished. They're never discarded. If they're a true friend at midnight, it doesn't matter if you moved from here to Lynchburg or, well, that's close, you know. You could move from here to Orlando. You could move from here to Japan. Would it matter? It wouldn't matter. Because a true friend at midnight is a friend always. We have, you have friends that live far away. If they're really your friends, sometimes those are the hardest friends to have because if you're truly friends with them and they're in trouble and they live in Seattle, sometimes there's some sacrifice involved in getting to that friend. But you're a friend at midnight. Your soul and their soul is one and the same. But the second characteristic, and we have to keep this in mind, is that according to the biblical principle, once a friend is made, that friend must be cherished. Friends are never to be discarded. Never to be put aside for somebody that's new or more popular. Wow, this other person came and they're much more interesting than you are. I'm not going to spend time with you anymore because I have this new friend over here. Well, in a friend at midnight, you can have many friends. That's the beauty of it. You can have many friends, but you would never discard one person 
and say, I want to be with this other person. I don't need to spend time with you anymore because I got this other friend over here much more interesting. On the contrary, f Christian friends, friends at midnight are cherished all your life. And more so, your father's friends become your friends. Your friends become your children's friends. And you build a strong community this way. Now that brings us to our third aspect, or our third principle of a friend at midnight. And this one is the hardest one. Most of them so far are pretty easy. But the third one is a little bit more difficult. Because a true friend at midnight builds character, your character. A real friend will build your character. Let's read what it, said in, what it says in Proverbs 27, now verse 17, just seven verses later than we were a moment ago. In Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, it's a little bit sharp here. It says, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. If you will be a true friend at midnight, and your friend is doing something that's wrong, somebody who is really your friend, who you're bound together with, and they're doing something that you know is contrary to the will of God, that you know is going to harm them, what will you do? It says here that as difficult as it is, you will still tell them. That is true friendship. True friendship is not, wow, my brother, my friend is sinking. Well, you know, I don't want to tell him that he's sinking because that would be rude of me. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell him how he's sinking very well. <laughs> I won't tell him that he's going to drown if he continues you know, paddling or swimming the way that he is. He's finished. Rather, I think in a worldly sense, well, I better not hurt their feelings. But the Bible says, and it uses such a strong, <clears throat> strong symbol here of iron sharpening iron. Have you ever seen iron sharpening another iron? What happens? There are sparks. Because if it's sharpening one another, then that means that one of them is a little bit rough, right? So as, as these rough edges of metal scrape one against the other, what happens? There are sparks. It's not always so beautiful. And yet, the Bible says that if you are truly a friend, a true friend at midnight, you will not be afraid of this. Because your friendship will be strong enough that you can go to that person and you can say, you know, my friend, please let me help you because you're drowning. That's a true friend at midnight. They'll build your character. You never make friends then by flattering somebody. If, I, if somebody comes to you and they say, how do I look today? And they look terrible. Well, you have to be diplomatic. Right? You got to know how to say it. But you're never going to lie to a person. You're never going to flatter a person. You're never going to call me tall. Right? I'm average height. You're never going to come to, wow, David, you look so tall. Why? Why? Because then you're not my friend. Because you're actually just flattering me. That's not friendship. That means that the whole basis of our relationship is that we lie to each other. Well, what happens when I do something wrong? You're just going to keep right on lying. Because our friendship is based on that concept that's there. So the Bible tells us that true friendship will help each other's characters. But at the same time, as building character, we never put character down. And this is what makes this third point more difficult than the other ones. Because some of us think that our responsibility is to critique the world. So we go from one extreme of lying to everybody and just flattering them all the time to the other extreme. Where we go to people who are not our friends and we tell them, you know, I'm your friend. And you're doing this wrong, and this wrong, and this wrong. You're a terrible person. You do this and this. And usually we start out by saying, you know, I'm your friend. But in reality, if we're dissecting that person, if we're actually putting their character down, that's not helping them. That's not a friend either. 
That's violating this third point just as much as the previous verse. That's why in Proverbs 22 and verse 24, the wise man writes that Proverbs 22, 24, it says, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go. We forgot about this first, didn't we? I know some people who I've never seen smile. I know some people, I've never seen them smile. I, I've never seen them be happy and joyful. And they always seem like something is wrong in their life. And the Bible says that with such people, don't, don't make friends with them. Because friendship is a union of characters, of souls together. And if they're an angry person, what will happen to you as you join together with them? You'll partake of that same spirit. And now there you are, and all of a sudden you're coming and you're talking with your other friends and they're like, no, something happened with David, he's changed. He's bitter and he's critical and he makes fun of everything and he criticizes everything. Something happened to David. What happened? He joined himself, contrary to biblical wisdom, to somebody who was angry. And the second part of the verse is just as important. It says that with a furious man thou shalt not go. When somebody comes to you and they say, come with me right now. I need to talk to you right now. Should you go? No. Mm, you should not go. The Bible says that when somebody comes to you and they're furious and they're in that condition, you should not go. Why? For your own safety. The Bible is concerned. Because as you go and that person begins to attack and speak in that way, what happens to your own countenance? You begin to partake. Usually we start to respond in kind. The more that they scream at us, the louder we get in response. And the Bible says, when somebody comes to you and they're furious, don't go with them. They need a little bit of time to think, to ponder, to pray. You should talk to them, of course, if there's some difficulty, some problem. But if a person comes to you and they have a you know, terrible countenance on their face, the Bible is clear, send them away until they're ready to have a meaningful Christ-like discussion with you. A friend will help you to overcome your difficulties. All of these trials and things. All of us do bad things. Maybe we've done something even to hurt somebody who is our friend. And now we need to fix these aspects of our character. A true friend will help you. They'll never be furious with you. They'll never be angry with you. That's why there's a Chinese proverb. We changed it a little bit in English, but there's a Chinese proverb that says that you should not use a hatchet to remove a fly from your friend's forehead. Right? Why? There's a reason for this, right? It's your friend. Right? They have the fly on the forehead. Do you want to remove it? You do. You do. You want to help them. You don't want them to have the fly on their forehead. You want to help them. But the method that you use to do that will be the determination of whether you are a friend at midnight or whether you are a friend following the customs and ideas of this world. Now the fourth aspect, there are six altogether, the fourth aspect of a true friend at midnight is found in the verses that we read in our key text. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. The fourth aspect of true friend at midnight is that they will help you in your worst time of trouble. <coughs> That's the aspect. That's why in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, there is hope and there is sadness in these verses. It says, two are better than one. Mm -hmm. Because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. It doesn't say here that two, it doesn't stop and say two is better than one. That's not all it's saying here, but it gives an explanation. It doesn't say just two people walking together are good. But it says that two people walking together are good because when one falls down, the other will help him up. If there's two of us walking together, 
and one falls down and the other keeps going. Was it any good that there were two of them? No, there's no benefit there. That's why the wise man says that there are two are better than one because if they're really friends, friends at midnight, when the one falls down, what will the other do? He stops. He says, I will, I will help you. And he helps and picks him up. We know the story. I'm sure all of us have heard the poem, not a story, but a poem of the footprints in the sand. And the, and the young man looks behind and there were footprints, you know, two by two going there. And then he looks and for part of the way there's only one and he gets angry with the Lord. He says, why did you leave me? And what does the Lord say? Those are the parts where I carried you. That's a friend at midnight. The friend who helps when you are most in need. In the 17th century, there was a very famous English diarist. He wrote extensively in his many quotes. His name is Samuel Pepys. He was also a, an English administrator in the government. And he wrote that he was very happy about one thing. He said, I am mighty proud to have a spare bed for my friends. He was happy that he had attained enough wealth in life that he was able in his house, in his little house, to have another bed somewhere where his friend could sleep. That's a friend at midnight. Somebody who's willing to help you when you are in your most difficult time. He's also the man, who, uh, by the way, who said that there are no strangers here, only friends which we have not yet met. Right? That's the same man. And we have a responsibility, if we will be friends at midnight, to help those around us. And usually it's going to be to help those who need it the most. That usually means people who are out there, who really need help. And the time will come when we're tested to see. You know the parable, we won't read today, but you know the parable that Christ told of the sheep and the goats in Matthew? And when Christ comes, they'll be divided so that they won't be together anymore. And the key difference between the sheep and the goats there is that when the messenger, in this case Christ, was sick and imprisoned and so forth, the sheep, they went, they visited, they helped, and the goats, they didn't. And this is the key characteristic which defines these two groups that are there. That's why the topic of friendship is so important to Christianity. It's not just something that we do. But it's an intrinsic part of Christianity because Christ himself uses it as an example of what will divide the sheep and the goats just prior to his coming, those that are real friends and those that are only acquaintances in this world. And then Henry Adams, who's an American here, a wor famous world traveler, Henry Adams, he wrote that to have one friend, like we're talking about, friend at midnight, to have one friend in a lifetime is much. Two are many. And three seems hardly possible that you could find three people who will really be your friend at midnight in the time when you are in your greatest need. Now the fifth point that we have here, two more to go, the fifth point that defines true friends at midnight is that a true friend at midnight is never ashamed of you. That's, this is also sometimes a tough one. We'd like to be friends with somebody, but we don't want other people to know that, they're, that we're friends with them. Like, I like that person, but I don't want other people to know that I like that person. Because nobody likes that person. So if people know that I like that person, then I won't be popular anymore. So I'm just kind of like, we meet on Tuesdays at 2 o'clock because everybody else at work. Mm -hmm. And this is not real friendship. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, the Apostle Paul, in all his chains and trials and tribulations, sitting there in Rome as he's writing the epistle to Timothy, he writes there that he had a very special friend, and he explains why this man is his friend. Pay close attention in 2 Timothy 1, 16. Why is Onesiphorus the friend of Paul? It says, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. So in the time, imagine, it's not very popular to be walking around the city of Rome in chains. 
You wouldn't want to be seen with somebody from the county jail. Mm -hmm. they, you'd be ashamed. This is somebody from the county jail. And yet it says here that a true friend, a friend at midnight, is one who's never ashamed of you. Even at your worst, even when you're having your most troubles and trials and difficulty, the real friend is the one who will still stick beside you and will tell other people and say, that's my friend, that's my friend. Knowing that by saying that, they're actually helping that person's reputation and building that person up and helping them. The final point of a friend at midnight has to do with sacrifice. A true friend at midnight is willing to sacrifice. That's why in John chapter 15, Christ gave the description of the true friend, the actual friend. In John chapter 15 verse 13, it says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. These are the six characteristics that we have for biblical friendship. These are the characteristics that define who are really our friends and who are not. There is another example in the Bible of a pair that actually had these six qualifications. And we find that in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 2, not Daniel and John, David and Jonathan anymore, but another pair of friends that we find in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 2. It says, And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Another example of true friends that were actually friends at midnight in the, in the time when they would have the most trouble. We mentioned the parable that Christ speaks of in the book of Matthew about the sheep and the goats. And that is because friendship is an important part that defines our fellowship together as Christians today in this time. Studies show that most Americans don't have any friends. Did you know that? Studies done by a number of very eminent psychologists find that most Americans today do not have one friend. They have many acquaintances. They have many people that they work with and that they associate with, but they don't have any friends. And that's because of the nature of friendship in this world, as we mentioned, being transitory, coming and going and not being an actual union of souls together. But we ourselves, we are actually supposed to be friends one to another. That's the defining characteristic when Christ comes to see us. That's the thing that is exemplified in the sheep, that they helped each other when they were sick, when they were in trouble, when they were in need, when they needed to pray together, when they needed to eat together, when they needed to counsel together. They were friends together. In our time, if we will be God's children, if we will be saved, if we will go with Him when He comes, we must begin the friendships here. We cannot begin friendships in heaven. Those friendships must be begun here on this earth. In heaven, they'll be fulfilled as we spend time with Christ. But they must begin here on earth. That's why in Psalms 119, longest chapter in the Bible, Psalms 119, verse 63, it says, I am a companion of all them that fear thee, and of them that keep thy precepts. He says, I have friends. Who are my friends? My friends, those that I can pray with, they are those that fear thee. Can we be a friend of someone who doesn't fear God? It's very difficult, impossible in fact. Because when we come together, what, what is the thing that actually binds us? It's Christ. And if somebody doesn't have that, it's very difficult for you to come together with them. So how is it then that we maintain this friendship, this fellowship as we call it, in the church? How do we maintain fellowship in the church? In the book of Malachi chapter 3 verse 16, Malachi 3.16 says, Then they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another, 
And the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. If we're God's children, if we're fellowshipping together, how often do we do this? It says here that they did it often. And I'm sure that they didn't only do it in church. Right? They fellowshiped together often. And as a result, what did God do when he saw the people fellowshipping together? It says they talked together often, those that feared the Lord. They spoke to each other often. What did God do as a result? He opened a book and he began to keep a record of these friendships that were being built on this earth. He began to keep a record of these friendships that are there. One of, in fact, in Acts chapter 2, we see this principle continued. As the apostle is speaking and they're, they're working there, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it's written, and they continued steadfastly in the apostle's doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. They didn't only come together in truth. They didn't only come together believing the same thing, but they were friends. They fellowshiped one with another. One of the most common references which I use, you know, I'm the secretary, so I'm writing letters all the time, writing letters, and we have a custom at the beginning of a letter that's being written to write a verse from Scripture. And the most common verse that you will find if you go through the archive here and see all the letters that uh, have been written since I'm the secretary, you'll find that one verse has been used at the beginning of letters more than any other verse. From Philippians chapter 1. The introduction to the book of Philippians chapter 1 verses 3 to 5. It exemplifies actual Christian friendship. It says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. What does the apostle say? True friendship, true fellowship. He says, look, you're my friends, and every time I think of you, I thank God. Now, if you can say that about somebody, then they're your friend. If, on the other hand, you say, well, every time I think of him, you know, I think of grapefruit. Yeah. Sour, bitter, good for you, but sour and bitter. It's not real friendship. Right? So I thank God every time I think of that person. That's true friendship that's there. And our union then with one another is what makes possible also our union with Christ. So that our union with Christ is made larger as we unite one with another, as those individuals are uniting with Christ and we're uniting with Christ and uniting with each other, that bond becomes bigger and stronger. So in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, the, apostle, the beloved disciple writes, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. On the other hand, though, we will have to be careful. If we will have true friends, if we will be friends at midnight, then we must be careful with whom we associate because there is danger of introducing into this bond a contamination that's there. You'll notice that the Apostle Paul, who wrote many of the things that we read here, he also had difficulties sometimes. There were some people who wanted to be his friends who weren't. Notice that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, it's speaking about a man named Demas. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Demas hath forsaken me. Why? Having loved this present world. Why couldn't Demas be the friend of Paul? It wasn't from a lack of Paul's desire. From the verse here, we can see that Paul wanted Demas to be his friend. But Demas and Paul could not be together because Demas had a first love. And his first love was where? In this world. Where was Paul's first love? With Christ. They, could, they were not compatible together. There can be no fellowship, no true friendship outside of the care of God. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Love not the world, 
neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. But true love only comes from the Father. That means if I love the world, I don't have in me that love. Can I ever be a friend at midnight to anyone? No. That's why this world is suffering. That's why studies show that people don't have friends today. Because they want to associate with somebody who loves this world. And somebody who loves this world, they don't have actual love in them. They can never be a true friend at midnight. That's why, of course, the Apostle James, he says it much more strongly than John. It's a little bit more of a firebrand than John was, at this point anyways. And in James chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So the exact opposite of friendship to be the enemy. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, the Apostle Paul writes, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. This is because we can be corrupted by association. Even by words. Even by listening to some words. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, we're told that even words can destroy friendship. Even now we said before that they're such inconsequential things, and yet at the same time they can be so harmful. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Just there. The Spirit of Prophecy tells us in Councils to Parents, Teachers, and Students on page 220, it says, God's Word places stress upon the influence of association, even on men and women. How much greater is its power on the developing mind and character of children and youth? The company they keep, the principles they adopt, the habits they form, will decide the question of their usefulness here and of their future destiny. That's there. There's a whole section in messages to young people about the danger that we can fall into in finding the wrong friends. Rather, then, we have to be careful of one other thing as we conclude here. And that is that there are some individuals then, not balanced, they take these words and they run to another extreme. And they say, well, I can never have a friend in the world. And in a way, that's correct. That's what we read here. But that means that the church would never, ever grow. The church would never grow because we'd all become good friends right here in this room. Everybody in the room become best friends. We'll be the best friends in Roanoke, the only real friends in Roanoke. And all the other people out there will shun them, you know, so that they'll never know true friendship. And that, that's not God's plan for us. Rather, we're told in John chapter 3, verse 17, as we follow the example of Christ, that we will do what Christ did to make new friends. How did He make new friends? It says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. If you would like to make new friends, what's the best way to make a new friend? To bring them to Christ. The closer we bring them to Christ, the more chance that we will be able to have a true friend. That's how we make new friends. That's the other thing that's different in the world. When you make a friend, you bring that person to yourself. They become a possession. My personal friend. But a friend at midnight is actually bringing a person where? To Christ. And the closer they bring that person to Christ, the closer their friendship becomes. They become actual friends, friends at midnight that's there. God wants us to have this friendship. And He knows that sometimes we will not be able to find friends. He knows that sometimes we'll need help directly from Him. So He says, don't worry. I know sometimes that you may be alone. He may send you to a place where you're the only Christian. I know some people who've had that happen. Maybe some of you here have had that experience. You've been in a place where you've been alone. You've been the only one there. The only one who's close with Christ in the place where you are. You're traveling or you're moved. Then God says, don't worry. I will, I will take care of you. In John chapter 15, verse 12 to 14, it says, This is my commandment, that ye love one another 
as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends. When? If you do whatsoever I have commanded you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Isn't that wonderful? God says, you are my friend. There. I am your friend at midnight. I am your friend at midnight. In the time when you need a friend the most, I will be there for you. He says, not only are you my friend, but in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. It's there. And Christ is our friend because we mentioned that the Apostle Paul, or sorry, that we mentioned that David and Jonathan were friends at midnight, true friends, because what had happened with their souls? Their souls had become one then how can Christ be our friend? How can He say here, you're my friend? What's happened then? Well, we read in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, why it is that God says that we can be friends, according to the biblical principle, friends at midnight, because He says that Christ is in you, the hope of glory. It's my wish and prayer for us today as we close our divine service and as we sing this final hymn that we'll remember that Christ is our friend and that he's our example and that each one of us in this room we should be able to look around to everyone else in this room and we should be able to say that I will be that person's friend at midnight when they need me the most I will be there I will help them and I will bring them even closer to Christ that's my wish and prayer for each of us today. Amen. That's heaven. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity that you've given us to be able to gather here once more, to fellowship together, to be able to spend this time coming closer to you. We ask, Lord, that as we go into this coming week, that you will be with us to guide us, to help us that our feet may only go on the path which you would have us to tread this week. Take care of us, Lord, that the tempter will not be able to deceive us, and that we might be able to come to the next Sabbath knowing that we've done everything this week to your honor and to your glory. Amen. We ask, Lord, that you would help us, that we might be true friends to those around us, Amen. that we might bring them closer to you, and that we might be able to say that we'll be friends at midnight, that our souls will be united one to another as we together come closer to you. We pray, Lord, that you will come quickly, that you will... Show yourself to the people of this world here that we might be able to spend eternity with you. And we ask, Lord, that you would be this day also with those who are traveling away from us, the brethren who travel to different countries from this place to do your work, and ask that you would give them a special portion of this Sabbath day's blessing, just as you will to the poor, the sick, and the needy, and those who are in countries where they're not as fortunate as we are to have these wonderful liberties of freedom to be able to worship. We ask, Lord, also as we look back that you would forgive us any sins that we might have committed this past week and help us in the week to come. We ask these things, Lord, not because we are worthy, but in Jesus' precious name, amen. amen.